All right, everybody, welcome to the Vigilant Path Podcast. I'm Eric Frazier. Uh, with me today, I have a very special guest, longtime uh, friend and fellow competitor from a sport that I have um, really loved and cherished over the years. Uh, this is with me, Dan McKim, uh, multiple-time national champion, multiple-time world champion, multiple-time record holder, uh, outstanding human being, uh, man of faith. Um, today, we're we're just going to learn a little bit more about Dan and how he got started in his journey as an athlete, uh, how his faith has you know shaped him and to the man he is today, and um, get a little bit about his philosophy on you know leadership and mentoring others. Take it away, Dan. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Great to uh, great to chat with you, man. It's been a it's been a minute. I mean, we did cross paths a couple weeks ago, but it, it's good to just. It's good to see your face again. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to hear about first, man? Uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about, you know, what got you drawn to um, getting into lifting and what attracted you to the throwing world uh, and what kind of led you to pivot into the Scottish Highland Games? Yeah. So I am the one I am one of three sons in my family. So I grew up with two bros, one older, one younger. I always say the younger one got the athletic ability. The older one got the smarts. I just got the good looks. And uh, everyone says that they must be pretty ugly, which they are. Uh, but no, I love my bros. And we grew up just playing every, any and every sport. So if it was baseball season, we're out playing catch, playing baseball, wiffle ball, doesn't matter. If it's basketball, we're playing in the driveway, doing that football. We got neighbor kids involved and we're, we're just rocking and rolling, doing anything and everything. And I actually got into throwing because my older brother was doing it. Now, he's not uh, he's he's quicker than me. So he was running sprints and he was doing throws. But I saw him do it. He was a stud, especially in middle school, broke all the records. And then I came along and was complete trash my my middle school years i almost quit and that's what's crazy man he's talking about like where does how god takes you on paths right yeah <laughs> my path almost did not include throwing and i gotta think it probably would not have included the scottish highland games so i had a bad experience my oh man i, I don't so my eighth grade year we are we just got done with the track meet i think it was a savannah our rival we lost and our coach sits everybody down. And he's going, he's like, well, we didn't get our points we needed in these events. And one of the ones we struggled was throws, shot and disc, didn't score enough points, and we lost the meet. And he looks right at me. He's like, we need to do better next time or something like that. I just remember, like, he totally called me out in front of everybody that we lost the meet because I didn't throw very far. And I was like, okay, Joker. I don't want to throw anymore. And so my freshman year, I almost <laughs> remember talking to my parents. I was like, I am going to play baseball. And they're like, son, you haven't played since coach pitch. And even that you played one year. And remember? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And they're like, you know how you're scared of the ball? Like the ball comes to you and you're just scared? Yeah. It's going to be a lot worse than high school. I was like, yeah, but I just don't want to throw anymore. But I thankfully, and this is where I'm thankful God's path took me there was thankfully I did decide to throw and and the rest is from there, man, as I kind of clamored around a little bit my freshman year, got better by my sophomore and junior year and started to catch on. But I look back now and I'm like, man, what would have happened? Like, and that's the thing, man, is like I'm where my where I'm at in my career because of the Lord taking me down the path of throwing. I got my school, my college paid for because of throws, doing the Highland Games. Had I played baseball, like, where would I be, you know? It makes you kind of wonder, like, why? And, and sometimes we don't always know till later um, why God puts us in places that we are. But I'm so thankful I decided to <laughs> decide to keep throwing. Yeah. And, what, uh, um, what, what, when did that fire really kind of start to, to explode? I mean, you say initially it was just kind of something you had to jump into score a few more points but when did you realize like man i really like this this is what i want to do with my life i feel like god put me where i'm supposed to be i think it was probably after the first part was after my sophomore year i remember i went to i made it to sectionals i made it out of districts 
And I was like, dude, didn't make a state. I was not as near decorated as thrower as you were, my friend. So you have to remember, this was like, I didn't even have throwing shoes. And so I remember going and I made, I'm like, bro, I made it in discus to sectionals, like, which is top four from districts go to sectionals and top four from there go to state. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't even have throwing shoes. And I was like, I'm going to get throwing shoes. And everyone's like, what? That's crazy. Throwing shoes. Yeah. So I got throwing shoes. And I remember that was kind of my junior year. I was like, oh man, this is super cool. I had one, I had a guy older than me, one year older than me, Mike. And he was a great, he was a good friend. We had a great time and we would, uh, for our area, we would go and score points. We were like first and second, first and third, like every meet. And so we were just cranking out points. Our throws coach was super fun. Great guy. Coach Reed had huge calves. Um, but huge he, calves. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, kind of those old man calves, you know, yeah. like lawn mown calves. Yeah. And, uh, He was awesome. We had a great time. And that's when I was like, man, I really enjoy this. And then my senior year, I uh, started to get some interest, but not from any big schools or anything, just uh, one or two, like, like NAI schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, excuse me, but my local school, I live where there's a D2 school, Northwest Missouri State University. And finally, that coach wasn't recruiting me because he was like, you're just going to go to the school your parents went to. You're not going to come here. And so finally he invited me in for a, um, for a visit, you know, just like a sit down, talk about maybe you throw here and all that. And, uh, and we went and showed up and my parents came, I got all dressed up and we sat in the waiting room for two hours and he never showed up. And then finally, like, I can, I can imagine like as a parent, my dad and my mom, my dad, especially is like, all right, let's get out of here. This is, I can't believe this. You know, he's just like, frustrated uh, you know like how heartbreaking now i look back like if that was my son i'd be like doggone he has his hopes up i was kind of oblivious like well i don't know i plan on throwing for free anyways just because i love throwing and we were walking out we're going we're in the parking lot and coach walks up and he's like hey we still on for this meeting and my dad was like we were <laughs> but you didn't show up. He's like, Oh no, was it two hours ago? Yeah, it was two hours ago. Oh no. Well, if you got time, come on in. We sat down and he offered me a, a small scholarship. And I was just like, I was like, cool, we'll sign today, bro. Cause I was going to throw for free. Don't tell yeah. you, but you didn't have to give me anything. Yeah. And I just loved throwing and went to college. And what's crazy is I love to throw, but I didn't love to lift or train, you know, like, and as you know, dude, it's like, it's hand in hand, right? Like mm-hmm. you want to throw far? Like I, I, I tell kids, so you want to throw far? You better lift. You're going to have to, you just got to be an animal in the weight room. There are a few guys that are just so naturally talented and gifted. They don't have to lift. They don't have to do anything like that. But I just didn't have that passion. And then after my sophomore year, or my freshman year, oh man, one of those awkward conversations, right? I am, uh, it's towards the end of my freshman year and I'm like, Ah, hey mom <laughs> she's dude i still remember still remember this i had a hernia right mm-hmm. like down low below my belly button but mm-hmm. i didn't know what it was i just know it was this bulge and i was like mom <laughs> just like super awkward and she's like what what's going on i was like i got a lump <laughs> she's just like what are you talking about and i was like i got this lump i've had it for a while i don't know what it is she's like oh, and i was like i don't want to show you <laughs> thankfully it wasn't super low it's it's pretty low it's yeah. pretty low it's below the belly button so she's like oh so we, thankfully our neighbor actually it was a down the street he down the street and around the corner he was a doctor my parents knew him so we we're like hey man can you check me out <laughs> He's probably like, awesome. You came to my house. You you want me to check a lump on you? Great. Turned out I had a hernia. I didn't even know about it. Yeah. And so what's crazy is I I had to have hernia surgery that summer and then I couldn't lift, right? Hernia, right. you can't lift for like six, eight weeks, whatever it was. And I remember at the time I was like, dude, this is driving me crazy. And it's what's wild is that sometimes you don't you don't respect or enjoy something until it's taken from you. And so I became like, I went from like, yeah, I'll train. And I trained, you know, because I did it. I was obedient and I was a disciplined kid. I did that. I did that. But I wasn't like hungry. I wasn't hungry to train. And uh, when I couldn't do it, I just like 
I got the bug, dude. And yeah, I swung the other way. So I was the guy that would come in and do coaches training, but that wasn't hard enough. That wasn't enough. So then I would do, you know, the weights, the weight, <laughs> the strength and conditioning stuff from the football team. Mm -hmm. So I was rolling out two and a half hours a day in the weight room. And I was just like, <laughs> and it worked for a while. And then, you know, how you get like, I'm not eating enough. I'm not sleeping enough. I'm not recovering. I'm overtrained. And I remember thinking like a year later, I'm like, man, I just, just tired. And I'm not, I'm not hitting the gains I like, but just means I got to work harder. Mm -hmm. Just going to stay longer. And it just went crazy. And I look back now, like, man, I wish somebody had grabbed that young knucklehead and said, Hey man, um, you need to gain about 30 pounds. If you want to throw further, you need to eat a ton more and you don't need to be here two and a half hours, five days a week. This is stupid. Yeah. Four or five days, whatever it was, but that's where I that's where I really got that passion and desire just to just to train. And and what was your I mean, what was your big takeaway from your experience in your you know college athletic career? And you know, tell us a little bit about how that pivoted into Scottish Highland Games and where you I feel like you really made a name for yourself in your career. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is that when I hit that passion for training, I hit the passion for throws. I had hit my sophomore year. I hit some bigger marks and my coach was leaving. He was only a grad assistant. And I was like, man, maybe I should transfer. Maybe I should try D1. You know, I had these big dreams. And I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to stay here and throw. And, and I, I had a, I had a goal, man. I was, I wanted to make it to USA nationals in the shot, you know, and that was my goal by my senior year was time went on. I realized pretty quick Olympics aren't my future. <laughs> Turns out the USA track and field is not in my future either. So what do I want to do? So I was staying up late one night. I'm sure I was, you know, studying super hard, lots of studies, you know, communications degrees, so hard. And, <laughs> uh, and ESPN2 was, was doing uh, the Scottish Highland Games. That was back in the day, man, when they had Estes Park, they had Pleasanton, and they had uh, – that the – was that the ultimate heavy athletic time period? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, dude, I was watching Sanford throw bombs and Ryan Vieira. I mean, it was Dave Brown. Yeah. I was like, holy cow, these guys are big, strong dudes. They're throwing stuff, and they get to wear a kilt. Mm -hmm. Sign me up. <laughs> so I graduated college, uh, got married, and we moved down to Kansas City. And I remember I called the guy. And I was like, hey, man, I saw you have like this demo kind of, it was just kind of like a demo, it was an ethnic festival. And uh, it was more like a demo thing. Like, and I said, like, hey, I'd really like to try this out. And he's like, yeah, man, come on up. And I was like, I got to sign up or anything. He's like, no, just show up. We'll show you and take care of you. I was like, okay. So I showed up in shorts and a sleeveless shirt. And I remember thinking at the time, man, I'm like, okay. Like I was a, I was a D2 all American shot putter, went to nationals, you know, and shot disc and hammer like i'm well-rounded i'm ready i'm 255 pounds in my mind i'm like i'm borderline huge <laughs> and, and i thought i am just gonna do great things and dude i got humbled so much that day daryl birch nathan and isaac and his dad they showed me how to throw caber and it was so embarrassing. I'm trying to hold the cable. I'm just like pitter patting around, like, oh, it's kind of falls in line. He's just like holding with one hand on my shoulder. He's like, it's okay. I got you. It's okay. And I'm like, man, this guy's in his 50s. I, at the time, I thought, like, man, he's old. He's like 40. But he, was, <laughs> <laughs> he was like 50s or 60s. And uh, I was just like, dude, what is going on? I'm I like a big old piece of humble pie. And I got to meet Sean Betts and Chad Ullum and Scott Campbell and Al and it was just like awesome. I was like, man, these people are amazing. Mm -hmm. These people are incredible. Uh, the event is super fun, and I realized, and they're all big. Like I thought, two fifty five was like, ooh. I was like, man, I need to be like two eighty five, three three hundred plus if I want to throw this stuff because it's so much heavier than than college. It's so much heavier stuff. And man, I went home and I was actually I didn't even go home. I went right to my office because we didn't have internet at the house at that time because I'm old. And we were cheap <laughs> and we had to go to the library for internet. Right. And I, I was stopped by my office and after hours and I pulled up NASGA, NASGA web. And I was, I was like, Holy cow, they got rankings. They got point system. There's a schedule. And I was just like, this is it. 
and I went full on addicted mode to trying to throw and and just fall in love with the sport, man. It was so much fun. Yeah, I remember we first met, was it 2005 or 2006? Yeah, at uh, Louisiana. And then, yeah, it was that uh, North versus South. I can't remember if we did that North South first or Pleasanton first together. They were pretty close together because that was 06, I think, was. Might have been 07. All I remember is I met you the first time and I was like, God, this guy's big. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I had gained a little bit more weight at that point, I think, because you wouldn't have said it in college. (laughs) Just like, hey, what's up, bro? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Have a Twinkie. <laughs> get you get you a little Debbie snack cake, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, when we first met, you know, we're competing. We're at that amateur level. We're all eager to try to get to that next level. Where those guys, you know, like you listed earlier, um, the Vieras, the the Larry Brocks, the Sean Betts, you know, the Harrison Bailey's, you know, the Dave Barons, all those guys that were really legends in that in, in that time or now they're legends but in that period of time i mean those guys were just just putting together huge performances almost it seemed like every weekend was a shootout um yeah fun fun guys to watch and i, I remember it just being kind of like you know you, you kind of get all struck by the difference in the level we were at versus where they were at at the time um when you made that jump to the pros, I remember you and Sean, um, you know, really started kind of opening up with the rest of us. Uh, I think Bert had turned pro during that time period. I remember us doing Bible study at uh, Pleasanton together. We did, um, you, you did it at Celtic every year. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. What, what, what put that on your heart? I mean, how did that yeah. come about? Yeah, I felt like whenever I started throwing in the Highland Games, I wanted to correct a mistake I made in college. So in college, I was very self-focused with throws and how far I was throwing and my whatever I was doing with that. And I wasn't I wasn't as outspoken about my faith and I wasn't very as much God focused as I needed to be. So I started to wear it as an amateur. I had a big I had a red shirt had believe on the front and white letters and on the back was Mark 115. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And I felt like any time that I could just wear that. So many times as we know, like when you're, when you're the pro level, you wear whatever shirt they give you based on mm-hmm. sponsors and such. Amateur, many of my games, I could wear whatever I wanted. So whether I was wearing it in competition or afterwards or beforehand, I wanted people to see, hopefully to see the see Christ in me. And not me just out there, you know, trying to throw far and do my thing, right? I wanted it to be more more Christ-focused than I previously was. And so that's where part of that was, is God kind of encouraged me, challenged me, like, hey, you all compete on Sundays sometimes, so why don't you have a Bible study? And so, yeah, I started offering Bible studies. Anytime we would compete on a Sunday, I offer a Bible study. I was telling one of my boys this the other day, he's talking about football and, like, doing prayers in the end zone and doing a Bible study before games and stuff. And and he's like, well, there won't be many people there. And I said, man, there are plenty of times where nobody's, nobody's there and that's okay. Right. And that's where we have to understand is God is honored in our obedience. And so while things don't always go like we want, the success isn't always there like we want. He's honored in our obedience and asking us to do things doesn't always mean we're going to have this amazing worldly success in it. It just means sometimes he wants us to obey. And so, but there were plenty of times, man, we had some awesome times in the word. It was so cool to be out there on the field on a Sunday beforehand and being in that circle and just opening up the word and sharing and then praying for each other. It was super cool, man. Those are, those are, that's something I miss is that just friendly camaraderie ability to just sit around a circle 
and spend time in the word. And sometimes, like you said, man, that we'd have men, sometimes we'd have people from that were judges or mm-hmm. uh, like a Celtic that maybe just heard about it and just show up and like, man, I don't even know who you are, but I appreciate it. that's cool. You're coming. Yeah. Those, those last uh, couple years that I competed with you at Celtic, um, I remember there were people that were just, they were there Saturday and they heard the announcement that you'd be doing that Sunday morning. A couple people showed up. I think a father and his son showed up one year. Um, yeah. I just thought that was really special. Uh, and, and a lot of the things, you know, it, I think that's what surprises people. Um, you know, you see these big, you know, humans out there, you know, kilted look like they're ready for battle and they're, you know, they're intense and they're, you know, they're, they're amped up and they're throwing, you know, these big numbers and they're, you know, full of energy and yelling and all this good stuff. But I mean, a lot of these guys were, you know, pretty introspective people. I mean, you know, uh, mm-hmm. some of the best books I've ever read, I, you know, I, I, I was recommended those books from you and Sean, uh, some of John Eldridge's work and, you know, that led to a whole spiral of, of reading other things. And, um, I think there's an opportunity for people to, to grow in surprising places. And I think to your point about the obedience piece, I think that's, that's where that plays in. Like when you, if you represent your beliefs well, and people know you're true and genuine, um, they're going to be drawn to you and they're going to be curious about, you know, what do you believe? Like what, where, where does that, that strength and that um, command presence and that character come from that, that you embody in the sport, you know? Right. That's right, man. That's a, and you're right. Is if you people are curious, people want to know, and that's mm-hmm. many times what we're called to do. We we're called to live it out so that the world may know. And how are they going to know unless we're willing to live it out? So it's good stuff. Absolutely. And you know, I remember was it 2010 uh, was your first time winning the national championship. Uh, yeah, Kelvin, came down the last event between half, you and me. Half a point. Yeah. Half a point. I was in, yeah. I was in training at the time to to get into law enforcement and uh, I think you were doing, you were doing the 28. We were in the last event. I was ready to sling it really far. And I was like, I think I walked up to you and I was like, Dan, you're, you're standing kind of tall in the middle of the throw. Why don't you get your hips down a little more? The next throw you hit like a lifetime best. And I'm like, did I just lose nationals? <laughs> I, I remember that man. Cause you're like, Hey, you know, I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, Eric throws bombs in the way. So I'm, I'd be dumb not to listen to him. I'll try it. And I remember I saw that video and I was like, it is super cool, man, because like <laughs> I get it. I, I know it's big, go crazy. And you're in the background and you're going, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, okay. He's and you're a jack for him, man. Yeah. Pretty- I mean, you're always a little sad. You're like, should I have told him after the event? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. But I mean, you, dude, you, I mean, from there you went on and you just did some incredible things in the sport. Um, you started with Sornex after that time period, right? You had won worlds once or twice by then. Yep. Is that correct? Yeah. I'd won twice before I started Sornex. Yep. What's that, what's that journey been like for you? Um, getting to, you know, share the, share the good news of, of, of the strength world to folks and getting the best equipment and getting out there and, and talking to folks and sharing your story with a lot of these strength and st- enthusiasts at the pro and college and high school levels. Yeah. Doing the Highland games was huge for me at my first part of the career. Cause so Sornex, like you said, Bert, Bert is the uh, owner of, of Sornex, Bert Soren. And he was in that 07 class, right? We were mm-hmm. in that, we talked about that as like, it was you, me, Bert, Pekoski. Oh, man, he was good. <laughs> and like, we were talking about like, man, that was a great class. Like, yeah. it, it was great uh, <laughs> that, but I know not everybody liked us all coming at the same time. <laughs> but we were just rolling, man. That was a, that was a tough crew. Absolutely. But he was part of that crew, man. And uh, we got to travel and compete with him, and I became friends with him. And he eventually had to retire because his body couldn't, couldn't hang on and his business started growing and started going crazy. So fast forward a couple of years after that, uh, I started doing, I was selling, I was working in the freight industry, transportation services, and I was running some freight stuff for Sornex. And Bert was like, Hey man, you want to come work for me? Like, I'm just, 
we're just flooded. I need somebody in the Midwest that could cover customers and stuff. And I was like, I'll start today. I was like, I am legit going door to door, getting the door slammed in my face because I'm walking up to people and going, Hey, would you like to talk about LTL or full truckload? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you have anything I can ship? Yeah. And they're like, no, please leave. No loitering. No, uh, no soliciting. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. And that was a huge thing for me is still doing the throw in the Highland games. Cause that was my shtick for those, those years with, Customers, I walk up and I just learned so much because I was into training. I love to train, but I would learn stuff and pick their brain on things, implement things here and there, and then also get to go train. So it was like, and there were times, there were times, I'm sure Bert, especially at the beginning when I wasn't exactly, I was trying to get my feet under me. Bert probably figured my shit was I walk in with my gym bag and I'm all dressed and they go, hey, yo, you're the guy from Sornix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. Is there an open rack? Because I got to train. And then uh, that grassy area over there, I brought my gear and I'm going to throw. So, <laughs> oh yeah, Sornix, yeah, here's a brochure. Thanks, buddy. See it. <laughs> that wasn't how it went, but it, yeah. it did help because I could come in and train and and uh, talk shop, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm sure that helped you grow a lot as a person, as an athlete, to get exposed to just those different philosophies because you know as well as I do and and the strength world, especially, you know, you know, the collegiate world and the pro world, um, it's highly competitive. And, um, you know, a lot of those positions, they got to move across the country. So, I mean, you, you know, you're getting, um, you're getting wisdom passed down from people that have, that have been exposed to, you know, a lot of experts in the sport in different areas, whether it's Olympic sports or, uh, you know, football or baseball or or basketball, just those different training methodologies. I'm sure it was really fascinating. Yeah, it was. It was interesting, especially for me, the technology side. So things that they that happen now with technology, like that I wasn't exposed to growing up and and training wise and everything. And and I, you know, I'm just training out of my garage or training out of the local Globo gym for many years. <laughs> and so it's just like. I'm not exposed. I'm like, Ooh, what is this? What do you mean by this? I'm like, well, this is, this is, you know, Tendo's to gym awares to force plates and all those things that's measuring. And I'm just like, wow, this is cool. And then, well, this is showing you have a deficiency in this. I'm like, Ooh, put me on the thing here. Let me see this. And yeah. so I was just trying to learn. And it was, it was interesting, man. Cause you're right. There's so many different methodologies, so many different influences. How do you take as an athlete? Right. And when, like for us training ourselves, how do I take pieces and go, ooh, I like this, but I could do without that. <laughs> and this might work for me. So it was a it's been a it was a fun, fun uh experience to try and put that all together. Absolutely. And um you've done some uh writing and speaking as well um uh, in recent years. Is that correct? I would say pre-COVID, and honestly, man, when I was throwing, that's when I used to do a lot more speaking. Um mm -hmm. But honestly, it's 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 been good. It's been great. Like I do a lot more speaking, I guess, within my church now. Before, and I really pushed it, and I really not pushed it, but I pursued it more. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do some public speaking there for a while. I thought oh, I'm just gonna, I just want to do that as my career. And uh, I was kind of frustrated. I was like, Lord, why aren't you opening these doors, these opportunities? And I think it came more so that He wanted me to speak locally. And so I had dreams and visions of being a keynote speaker and doing all those crazy things, man. But like now I teach my wife and I, we, I teach a young marriage class. And so I teach every week. Um, I led a men's Bible study on Wednesday nights for six years. And before that, I taught another class and taught another class or sometimes I, I'll speak at a men's uh, spoken at a men's men's event in Kansas City area two or three months ago. So those types of things is like. And that's one thing that God always sh showed me over the years was we think our platform is small. Mm -hmm. We think it's, oh, I'm not on, ES like for us throwers, you know, like well, we're not on ESPN and we're not on the CBA. We're not doing all these crazy things. But God convicted me of just saying like, hey, the platform, he does great things on any of that platform. It's not that it's a small platform. It's just the platform you don't think it is. It is a platform. And you've got to speak, you've got to challenge, you've got to move, you've got to influence and encourage and challenge and uh, disciple people, no matter how, no matter where you're at. And so that's where he kind of convicted me is like, hey, dude, I know you think you want to be this keynote guy, but I got you here for a reason. 
Yeah, I mean, I I feel like um, you always did a really just great job of of um, running the small group side of things, and that's the only given. I'm biased because that's the only thing I observed when we you know competed together. But I mean, those those small group conversations, and you you did a you did a wonderful job leading that stuff. Sean did a great job helping to lead that stuff. Um, you know, you you guys you showed me through those experiences, a different side of competition and realizing like, this isn't just about winning a couple dollars or, you know, winning a trophy or getting some made up title. Like this is, this is about becoming a better human being and, and, and learning from each other. That's right, man. That's exactly right. So how did you pivot from that to making some really entertaining content? <laughs> uh, how did this get started? You got to tell me. Oh, man. So I always kind of have a obscure sense of humor, uh, I guess, observe things. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I started oh, it was a number of years ago. I just made some stupid videos and it just kind of caught on. I found out it's, it's a creative outlet for me that I enjoy. So mm-hmm. my videos are are just creative, fun videos that poke fun and humor at the strength industry. So What's crazy, man, is the comments I get sometimes are like, oh, great, you're making, like I do something about CrossFitters, you know, oh, yeah. like, oh, you're making fun of people in the comments will be like, you're making fun of people who are out there in shape and working hard. Why would you bring them down? And I'm like, like, dude, this is all for fun. You should see what I do with throwers. throwers yeah. are, are, we're all quirky. We yeah. all have this, like, I always think about that. Like when it comes to the strength industry, man, whether you're a, a crossfitter, a strongman, a thrower, a power lifter, a bodybuilder, whatever it is. Number one, we're all very vain because we're clearly doing <laughs> we're clearly doing it to either become like better at a sport or honestly better looking, right? And number two, we're all kind of weird. Like if you really think about it, we do a lot of quirky things, a lot of weird, obscure things, and that's okay because it's fun. And so I just started making them, and I found out, man, it's just a creative outlet. It's very very niche humor that's for sure yeah that's fantastic man you got i mean we've got to make a joke of this stuff sometimes i mean you can get you can get so tied up into things and get so serious about stuff to where you're you lose the joy in it it becomes a job um, and it becomes too prideful to the point to where like you've you've taken yourself so seriously that you just kind of start becoming a jerk so we've got to we got to realize like whatever we have in life can be taken away at any day. So we, we need to have a little bit of grace about it and just enjoy it while we can do it. Have fun. Like you say, be obedient. Um, and just, just enjoy those opportunities as they come up. That's right. That's right, man. Good word. There you go. Um, so random question. Have you covered any of um, John Lavelle's work? Have you followed him at all? No. Uh, Warrior Poet Way good read okay. yeah, good read okay yeah but um i don't know i i feel like i don't know, i feel like i miss having you out there i started uh i started training again yeah um videos look good man i was like dude i know that technique <laughs> i watched that technique so many times i know exactly i know that yell <laughs> I, know the, <laughs> I know the yell i know the walk yeah. I know everything, man. It yeah. was good to see you. How did it feel? Uh, good. <laughs> it felt good. But, I mean, it's just, it's weird. I mean, I, it's exciting to know that they, they have masters for us now, you know. Mm-hmm. To, something to get back into and just get out there and move a little bit and have fun without beating our bodies up as much. But, um, I don't know. I really miss throwing. I think... I think it'll truly be just for fun this time. Um, you know, like not, you know, not taking it too seriously like I have in the past and letting it kind of take over my drives and motivations and all that good stuff. But um, how are you gonna handle that, man? Because that was that was be my big question for you is knowing, okay, I'm not gonna hit those marks. I mean, have you come like to where you're like, I'm not going to hit those marks again. Or are you like, dude, I am going to beat all my previous PRs. No, I, um, 
so you know when we when we did the celebration live for uh Richard um we talked a little bit about it but you know this year I started coaching uh shot and discus at the local high school yeah. and you know part of what I do with the kids is we just talk about life stuff we talk about you know that this is a uh metaphor for life um you know in life we're always going to wrestle with something and that's just that's just part of our experience on this earth yeah. but do we handle it in a safe way do we do we do the right things when we have control over what we're dealing with and do we let go of it in the right way in the right healthy direction in our life and to yeah. me that's kind of what throwing is like you're you're wrestling with something you're struggling with something and if you do the right things within with, with within what's in your grasp uh you can have a positive outcome and you can have a reason to celebrate that experience mm-hmm. and that's kind of what i try to tell the kids and the other thing i tell them is i'm like look this is something you you can do for the rest of your life like you can throw until you are pick an age i mean they have senior games they have masters usa track and field they have masters highland games at all ages like you take care of your body, you know, it's it's a reason to stay fit. It's a great way to maintain friendships and, and common bonds with people that, you know, you, you share life experiences with. And um, I mean, the kids seem to be really receptive of the message. And I guess that led to training again. And because at first I was like, well, maybe I'll just throw a little discus with them here and there and push them in practice or um you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll show them some Highland game stuff one day. Some of the kids are interested in learning more about that. And then it was like, huh, I'm not moving so bad. That doesn't hurt as much as I thought it would. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm getting some good coaching, uh, from, uh, Adrian and she's, she's helping me to understand the importance of mobility and flexibility. You know, you talked earlier about, um, some of those nerdier things we can do like with Tendo units and force plates and those kind of things. But what I'm finding is good old fashioned mobility, stretching, just yeah. getting that tissue moving again is uh, something I really wish we had done when we were younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd probably be feeling, we'd probably be feeling a lot better right now. Yeah. There'd, there'd probably be a, a lot less rice crispy action in the joints. <laughs> yeah. But um, but what um, you know, what are your what are your projections for the future? I know you're uh, you're a father and leader in your community. I mean, what what's next for you? Um, I know you're loving life at Sornex. I know you're very happy with your career. Um, what you know, what's on your heart for next steps? Man, that's a great question, buddy. Um, man, I, I think I'm at a different stage of life now. Um, I don't have any hobbies. I don't have any uh, pursuits or anything pastimes. I mean, honestly, man, it's just spend time with my kids. I, I realize how short that time is and how fleeting that is. I've got a, you know, my oldest is a senior, going to be a senior this year. And so, dude, I, I still got a picture from 07. So at Pleasanton, you know how like that staging area before we go throw Caber is like that, the horse stalls, right? Mm-hmm. He came out as my first pro games, and my wife and him, firstborn, came out. I have a picture of me feeding him a bottle in that, like in my kill, still ready to go. Right before we're gonna throw Caber, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll feed him a bottle real quick. And I'm in the stall, like feeding him a bottle. And my wife took a picture of it. I still have that picture. And it's like, dude, it just seems like yesterday and how quick time flies. And so for me, anymore, man, it's about spinning and making that making time with my kids as memorable and cherish much as I can cherish and hopefully instill and instruct and encourage and challenge them as much as I can, man. Cause it's just like, dude, it goes so fast. Time is so fast, man. It just feels like yesterday I was going down to Mississippi and going to go throw against this young dude named Eric Frazier, who's just blowing everything up and throwing stuff. And he's the number one amateur in the world. He's just crushing everybody. Oh, he broke the world, breaks some world records. And he's still somehow throwing weights and hammers real far. And he's coming out throwing Highland games. And like, then I fast forward and here we are, you know, 
I don't know how many years later, 15, 20. Yeah. A little bit of, a little bit of salt and pepper. And yeah, I know, man. It's we got crazy, our, it? we got our, we got our wisdom whiskers and our battle scars. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right, man. We're like, uh, what is it like? Uh, it's like, you're just happy if you've had a good nap that day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care how big, how big your deadlift was. You're like, did I get time for that 15 minute cat nap? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, man. But no, oh, man, um, could I talk you into some masters at some point? Oh, man, no. No? No, no, I couldn't. I, I've i had people ask before, like, hey, you're going to throw masters? Like, oh, it's going to be fun. I was like, no, nah, man, I can't. You're you're better at that than I am. I cannot get past the fact of, like, never being able to throw another PR, of, like, never hitting that mark again, you know, to, to do that. Like, my body, I'm 42, and I know my body is, I've, I've put it through it, and it's, it's done what it's done, but it's time to, time to go on. Now, I would love to judge. I would love to be an announcer. I would do that at a games in a heartbeat. But competing, no, I don't think I could do it. You think that's like an emotional thing for you, or would it be emotional? I don't know. I think, uh, dude, it was crazy. You sent me those videos and I'm like, I'm watching you throw and the bagpipes are super loud. And dude, it just like took me there. And I could, I could, I could smell tacky. <laughs> I could taste funnel cakes. I mean, like, I, <laughs> no, but it brought me back so quick. And so I don't know that it would be super emotional. I just think the competitive side of me couldn't, couldn't handle like, throwing masters and not throwing for anything else. But I think I'm an, honestly, man, I think where I come to is that I look back and my family gave up a lot for me to throw. I mm-hmm. spent a lot of time in the field. I spent time traveling. That's why at the end of my career, I only did a few games a year just to spend more time at home. And I think there are times, man, honestly, between you and me that I feel, I feel guilt. Like I spent, I held on too long to throw and I threw, um, I threw a lot and I should have maybe, you know, maybe not thrown as long or something like that. And so there's, there's parts of me where I'm like, man, throwing was like a different part of my life. And that's in the past for me to compete. But I think being a judge would be fun. I think being an announcer would be fun. I think those things, I think I'm ready for that. I'm ready to do something like that. So just kind of being involved, but not necessarily need to be in in the in the swing of things in the mix of all of it. Yeah, I think, dude, I think just selfishly, if I went out and threw, you know, I couldn't throw a heavy hammer over. I think I think there's parts of me like, man, if I couldn't throw 110, 115, I would be ticked. And I'm like, that's okay. Like I don't have to throw. 110 one you know anymore it's okay but i think there's part of me i would just like oh man i do this well it's okay because all right i'm gonna hit this training i'm gonna do this i'm gonna gain 30 pounds back i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna throw that far again it's like nah bro it's okay time to be done i mean i view it like golf like not always gonna have the same handicap in your sport you know like just just go have fun and do something you used to love once in a while and see where it goes but i know a lot of people would just love to see you i mean you're um i lit up when i saw you down at sornex a couple weeks ago i was like there he is that's my buddy you know a lot of good memories came back um i always had a great time when we were on the field together um but yeah i think you know i i think in that capacity i think that was still at a lot of people's Um, or excuse me, add a lot of value to people's lives. Um, I know, you know, especially if you, you did some of the mentorship things like you did for a lot of us on the field, but, you know, just being there, you know, with, with the things that you've accomplished and in that sport and, and that common bond that, that you're going to have with a lot of the folks that are competing. I mean, you know, you've probably forgotten more about competing at a high level than a lot of people are even tapping on right now. Yeah. Not to, 
not to push your ego up too high, but just, I mean, facts are facts. No, no I, I think probably what it wind up is be you and me sharing old stories and people going, are these guys ever going to shut up? <laughs> <laughs> sharing old stories. <laughs> and we get mad and we're like, get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> we have become those masters guys. We grew up going, those guys just don't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess we can wrap up. Um, is there anything that you want to, you want to share to, to folks that might be watching this that, you know, is just on your heart, anything that, that, um, you think would be meaningful to wrap up with? No, man, I, this was great, dude. And I appreciate you chatting it up, man. It was good to, good to talk. And your listeners are probably appreciative that we didn't go straight nerd, throwing nerd mode where we talked throws the whole time, but it's good to, uh, man, it's good to just talk with you and, and so many good, good times over the years, dude. And just, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you doing this, man. Let me be a part of it. Absolutely, buddy. Well, it's been, you know, it's been an honor sharing, sharing the field with you in the past and sharing the screen with you now is fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll say to anyone that is interested in, uh, some of the best exercise equipment you can get. Uh, I would highly recommend you reach out to Dan. I will uh, leave some links at the bottom for anyone wanting to learn a little more about, you know, how Sorenex can help help those folks uh, achieve their goals. 